Welcome everyone uh, to this event on the independent ethics body for the for the European Union. Um, welcoming you on behalf of the four MEPs uh, that are jointly organizing uh, this event. So we have uh, Giuliano Pisapia from, from the SND, uh, the Social Democrats, who is a member of the Constitutional Affairs Committee, AFCO, who, who is here, one of the shadows. Um, we have Leila Shaibi, uh, shadow for the United Left, UE, uh, also the shadow from the AFCO committee. I'm not sure if Stefan Sejourné is here already, but he should join us um, shortly. He is the rapporteur in the Legal Affairs Committee, the opinion rapporteur in jury uh, for the Liberal Renew Group. I myself, I'm, I'm Daniel Freund. I'm the rapporteur from the Greens, also Constitutional Affairs Committee. Um, first, a technical note for, for all of you. You should be able to see at the bottom uh, under underneath the picture, a button for interpretation, where you can select uh, if you want to hear this event in English, French, or Italian, which is labeled by Zoom as uh, Spanish, but there is an, an Italian translation channel uh, available. So if you want to listen to the translation, it only works in the app, but at the bottom of the screen, you should have the button for that and you can select your, your channel. Uh, if you have any trouble with that, you can always write in the chat and someone from the team might be able to help you with that. Uh, I'm also very happy to uh, be able to welcome uh, Vice President Vera Jourova from, from the Commission. Uh, thanks for, for being here. I'm going to do a, a quick introduction to, to the general topic um, and then uh, give the word to the Commissioner before we um, go into the study with uh, Alberto Alemano, who is also here, a uh, law professor from HEC in, in, in Paris, who has worked on this topic as well. So um, I think we can start by saying that uh, the European Union probably has uh, better ethics rules, better transparency rules than many of, of the member states in, in the European Union. So on things like lobby transparency, on conflicts of interest, on, on revolving doors, um, there are reasonably good rules. Uh, but they are not always uh, very well implemented or, or enforced. We have seen over the last few years uh, a number of scandals that I think have highlighted some of the weaknesses uh, in the system. Um, maybe most notably, there was the case of former Commission President uh, Barroso, who joined uh, the investment bank Goldman Sachs after leaving office. Um, but he was not alone from, from the uh, commission that left in 2014. Uh, there was also Nelly Cruz as former digital commissioner who joined Uber and actually over 50% of, of the commissioners then that left uh, have joined organizations that are on the EU lobby register. For, for members of the European Parliament, um, those that have left over 30% also uh, joined organizations on the lobby register. Uh, the, one of the more notable cases there was the former chair of the Economics and Monetary Affairs Committee, uh, who a couple of months after leaving office joined the London Stock Exchange as, um, as lobbyists. Um, but not, not only for the high ranking politicians, we have also uh, seen cases at the uh, at the staff level so the the eu um, civil servants um, one particularly uh, outrageous case that i found uh, was a uh, someone who who joined the european commission from exxon mobile uh, then went on to work in dg energy and was responsible for the relations uh, with the opec countries then went on a sabbatical uh, from that position uh, to become the European chief lobbyist for, for the Saudi uh, Aramco oil company. Uh, so revolving in and out of the institution with, with lots of risks for, for, for conflicts of interest. Also, uh, another example is Adam Farkas, who was the head of the European Banking Authority, and then without any break, um, well, joined the Association of Financial Markets in Europe, so the lobby organization of the of, of the banks that he most recently um, regulated before joining them. Uh, in the European Parliament, um, we have seen that our own 
rules. Um, the, the, the code of conduct has been broken at least 24 times in the last couple of years, uh, and not a single one of those breaches has, has ever been sanctioned. Um, so there as well, even the rules that exist uh, don't, don't necessarily get enforced. And this, this of course, um, is a problem for, for citizens' trust in the EU, right? Um, these questions are about the, the functioning of, of our European democracy. It shouldn't be the case, obviously, that lobbyists write their own law or that money in any way uh, can buy decisions or influence with politicians. And um, I think in a situation where, where we, the institutions, have just approved uh, the next seven year budget and a, and a huge Corona uh, package with next generation EU. So we're spending more money uh, than ever. I think in that situation, it's, it's particularly crucial um, that the decisions on how and where this money is spent is in, in the general interest and that special interests individuals cannot shape uh, those uh, decisions in an unduly way. Uh, otherwise, I fear we fuel populism and, and, and Euroscepticism. And I think um, I'm, I'm very glad that uh, we have uh, several representatives um, from, from France here uh, today, because I think the French example is, uh, is a particular one where we have seen over the last few years how uh, a new body, the, the high authority, um, has has started working in this area, and I think has has really changed the culture in in, in that respect. So, very happy uh, to to be here today with all these key players, uh, and that we can discuss uh, the the creation of of the ethics body. But first, now I want to to turn to to the vice president uh, Jourova. Um, your, your commission, when you when you first joined the commission uh, six six years ago, and and a little bit, um, the commission stopped meeting unregistered lobbyists. And and you, as commissioner, you were the first generation that published their meetings. Uh, you have also toughened in the last mandate the, your own code of conduct. You have prolonged uh, the cooling off periods, uh, and and you just uh, finished the negotiations on on an updated EU EU lobby register. So that's quite a a track record. Um, actually, before the European elections, all the Spitzenkandidaten um, that were running for Commission President um, pledged that uh, an, an EU ethics body should be created. And, and Ursula von der Leyen, uh, during her um, well presentation to the European Parliament, uh, made that that same pledge. And it is now, uh, of course, in your mission letter, uh, Ms. Ms. Jourova, to to create that. So very glad that you can be here today and and speak a bit uh, what what your plans for this are. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Freund, dear honorable members, dear Professor Alemano, dear guests. Uh, I am very pleased to be here today with you and to open the event about the creation of an interinstitutional ethics body. And Mr. Freund, you are absolutely right. Uh, we need more trust from the people, but we have to deserve the trust. That's why it's, it's only good that uh, we have started already uh, concrete steps, uh, the transparency register was a very concrete uh, achievement, uh, which we uh, gained before the Christmas time. And uh, we have to continue the work on, uh, on, the, on improving the culture and the, the trust, which, which you mentioned. And the, some of the stories or cases you mentioned are just telling that uh, it's it's not artificial, that it's a real life which brings these situations uh, which uh, attract the attention of the public and we should be uh, doing more to set the rules and especially to guarantee the implementation of the rules so that we avoid uh, not only the, the cases themselves, but we are able to react on the cases in the proper way. And indeed, as you mentioned, the President von der Leyen has expressed her full support for the creation of the body in her political guidelines and <clears throat> Also recently, there have been many developments on this issue in the European Parliament. So I am glad that the things are moving on this issue. And this is a very good news, which, which I very welcome. Also, because indeed I have it in my let mission letter that it's it's on my shoulders here in the commission. And I, I will do uh, whatever I can to, to achieve good solutions. So it's also a good opportunity for me to share with you the preliminary views on this important file from the site of the Commission. 
we support the creation of such a body because we believe that the institutions of the European Union must, must meet the highest standards of independence, integrity, and impartiality. Uh, definitely already now we have higher standards than in many of the member states, but we should not compare ourselves with those who are behind us, but we, we should always seek for increasing the, the standards ourselves. Our institutions have a common mission to serve the general interest of the EU Union and need uh, the trust of European citizens. Therefore, not only our decisions must be right and convincing, but also our behavior must uh, be irreproachable and guided by ethical principles. Ethical behavior of staff and commissioners is of utmost importance for the Commission. Every unethical incident can endanger the whole reservoir of trust built over many years. That is why the Commission has developed a set of ethical values, principles and rules on the basis of the principles established by the treaties. The treaties and the new code of conduct for the members of the Commission adopted in 2018 constitute a comprehensive set of ethical obligations which ensure that the College of Commissioners acts in full independence in the Union's interest and for the public good. We are in favor of an interinstitutional ethics body, which has a competence for the members of the institutions who are the political representatives of the Union. This includes members of the Commission, but also the members of the European Parliament and the members of other EU institutions. Bringing such competence into the remit of a joint body is also a question of credibility of this process, which must be seen as a collective operation for enhancing ethics at EU level in general. We all know too well that many citizens do not distinguish between different institutions, but see uh, all institutions as the EU as a whole. This is why we must provide evidence of a true European culture of, on ethics. But the process of for setting up a joint body has to be respectful for the particularities of each institution, as well as the respective institutional and democratic role each institution and its members have to play. In other words, the body should not replace substitute or interfere with the responsibilities and prerogatives of each institution. The body's role and responsibilities have to respect the institutional balance between the EU institutions as established by the treaties. And it will be important to ensure that the proposal to be tabled gets a buy-in from every single institution. Currently, there are significant differences in the approaches of different EU institutions. For instance, the Commission has an independent ethical committee with external independent members. Uh, there are a former judge of the Court of Justice, a former member and vice president of the European Parliament and a retired di director general of the Commission. So this is the, uh, the committee we have uh, in the Commission. The other institutions, including the Parliament, have committees which are composed of current members of the institution. Therefore, when designing the body, we should take into account in our work the current practices and experiences in the different EU institutions. And we should also look at the various approaches in EU member states to ethical matters. Some member states, indeed, can be a source of inspiration for us. Looking at different approaches, both at national and EU level, will enrich our reflection and our discussions between institutions. All this is essential before making a proposal for the creation of the body. I welcome a lively debate on this topic, and I am particularly pleased that academic scholars study the various questions related to the, this idea from different angles and contribute to the debate. Academic studies like the study which Professor Alemano will present today are an important contribution to a public discussion as well. The creation of a new body 
needs, a careful assessment of the different options available, and above all, in-depth analysis of three points. The first one, the potential scope, role, and competences of the envisaged body. The second is the legal basis for the creation of the body. And the third, the interaction of the body with the existing legal and ethical frameworks in the different institutions. Similarly, we have already identified four key parameters for setting up the envisaged body. First, the highest ethical standards must be met. The exercise cannot result for any given institution in lowering standards than the current ones. Second, the independence and accountability of each institution as set out in the treaties is of fundamental importance for our democracy at EU level and must be respected. Third, there can be no overlap or duplication with existing independent bodies like the European Anti-Fraud Office, the European Ombudsman or the European Court of Auditors. And fourth, legality, fair rules and procedures, as well as expertise, independence and an impeccable professional background of the members of the future body are a must for the body's credibility and of it. In my view, we will have to work on these and other issues in the coming months in order to achieve concrete progress. So let me conclude. I am convinced that the key to success in the undertaking is, is balance. While creating an independent inter interinstitutional ethics body, we need to respect the independence of each institution and its members. We need to promote compliance with high ethical standards while acknowledging that our European institutions, their members, and the European civil service meet already today high ethical standards and deserve the trust of all European citizens. I am looking forward to this discussion in the coming months, and I am confident that in the end, we will succeed. I am convinced that we will see the creation of an independent ethics body that will enrich the institutional landscape of the EU and that will bring the reflection and analysis of what is ethical behavior in a given situation to a new depth. Uh, honorable members, dear Mr. Freund, uh, thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a fruitful debate today with many new insights. And now I'm very much curious to what I will hear from Professor Alemano. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Vice President, for, for sharing your thoughts. And, and indeed, uh, Alberto, um, we're, we're very curious to, to hear um, your, your thoughts. Uh, you're, of course, in Brussels, uh, a rather well-known figure. Uh, you um, apply politically uh, your, your legal expertise. You have, for example, previously uh, with a study, I think, given the harmonized whistleblower rules of the European Union, quite uh, quite a push. Um, so, so you have looked in your study now at uh, best practice examples from a from across uh, the European Union and I think beyond as well, uh, and identified a bit how how such an ethics body could actually look like, uh, legally speaking. So, the floor is yours. Uh, looking forward. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Ms. Jourova, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity, Daniel, and the other members of the European Parliament who are participating today. It has been a great opportunity to dedicate uh, some of my research time to de go a bit deeper uh, into the European ethics frameworks uh, that exist in the Union. And I will do my best in a pedagogical, possibly not pedantic way, to show you uh, what would it take uh, for the European Union uh, to actually set up um, a, Euro a European uh, ethics body. Um, in order to do so, I would like to make a step back and to go back to some of the issues that were mentioned by Mr. Robin and by Daniel. Uh, what is the European ethics system today? Where do we stand? And why it actually exists? If you look at the, the rationale, it's pretty intuitive, right? All public officials, regardless of whether they are elected, or appointed and their staff, they serve in the public interest. However, very often European officials, like any other public servants, 
they find themselves exposed to external pressure and they might find themselves uh, uh, at the time of the exercise of their mandate in a situation of conflict between their private interest and the duties of their position. So the European ethics framework has evolved over time in a very scattered fashion, institution by institution, in order to prevent and mitigate uh, negative consequences that might affect the European financial management, but in the long term also tarnish the European institutions image and uh, the European integration process uh, itself. So when we talk about ethical standards, we actually refer to a variety of principles, values, as Ms. Jourova said. Those are essentially the principle of independence, integrity, confidentiality, and discretion, which are introduced and imposed on our members of Parliament, the Commission, and of course the staff through a variety of legal sources. Uh, those are in the treaty, but also in secondary law, as you can see in a variety of legal documents. Not only the treaties, also the rules of procedure, the codes of conduct, they contain uh, do these uh, provisions. Uh, this table is one of the first attempt at systematizing those rules and seeing exactly what kind of hierarchy uh, do uh, occupy in European law. The second question is who is enforcing those ethical standards? And we already heard some illustrations from uh, uh, Daniel earlier on from Izurova saying that we have a variety of organizations of bodies that institution by institution do provide a, a monitoring of the respect of those provisions. We have advisory committees in the Parliament and in the Commission. We also have appointed authorities and disciplinary boards, institution by institution, when it comes to the staff. We certainly have the European courts, which have an exclusive competence for the alleged violation of such of those principles. And then we have OLAF, which has already been mentioned, who has not only a competence in relation to fraud and to, um, let's say, illegalities that might affect the European financial interest, but also specific competence when it comes to serious misconduct in terms of ethical norms. So not of all of them, but just the, the gravest uh, violations might trigger the intervention of, of OLAF. What sanctions are we talking about? Well, there is a possible taxonomy of sanctions. Some of them are reputational in nature. They are a reprimand, a warning that will simply leverage on social pressure in order to put an end to a behavior which is in breach of those uh, principles. But some other sanctions, they go beyond reputation and they affect the position in an institution. Think about relieving from responsibility uh, a member or a staff, uh, deferment of advancement in, in career, uh, the denying the right to speak or exclusion. And we recently witnessed some of those decisions taken at the party political level, not at the institutional level uh, in the European Parliament. We also see irreversible sanctions. So these are a situation of termination uh, that might also occur in relation to a member of parliament. This could be decided by the parliament itself upon the initiative of the president or a member of the European uh, Commission. And finally, also financial sanctions are contemplated and can be associated with those sanctions. So the question is how good this system is. You see how, uh, um, how uh, articulated it, it is, uh, certainly scoring above the average of what exists at the member state level. And the Court of Auditors in 2019 happily concluded that overall the EU has a, a good adequate ethical framework with some room for improvement and one major issue which has to do with the council, which has no mechanism for making sure representatives of the member state actually comply with those rules. But overall, this analysis seems to be positive. However, there's a methodological uh, annotation that has to be made. As the Court of Auditors says expressly, all the analysis by the court only focus on the law in the books. They only look at the standards. They didn't look at how those standards are applied, how enforced, and what kinds of sanctions are actually adopted. In other words, the empirical dimension totally lacked. But when you look at the enforcement, and that's exactly what this report tried to do by interviewing a lot of key figures in the institutions and other academics who have been working in this matter, the image that emerged is very different. And this is certainly symbolized by some of the emblematic cases that Daniel mentioned, some former 
uh, European commissioners, uh, but also some former members of the European Parliament who managed to get away uh, with a full compliance of those obligations. Uh, this is certainly the case of Rashida Dati, as you can see in this table, or Neely Cruz, who merely apologized for uh, forgetting not to report all this information uh, before actually uh, entering into the function of a commissioner. And when we look at the more recent uh, emblematic cases, we also see situations, uh, some of them were referred to by Daniel, in which there hasn't been inaction. Uh, as opposed to that, we could see uh, the advisory bodies uh, taking action, authorizing staff, for instance, leaving the European Commission, making this move out of the institution, either on a temporary basis, which is the case of Kruger, or on a definitive basis, which is the case of Sala, upon the compliance of certain conditions. But when you look at those conditions, how they've been formulated and the way in which they are today enforced, you could see they are unsatisfactory. It is pretty clear that there is certainly a perception and possibly a substantive violation of some of the principles I mentioned in the current circumstances. So a diagnosis of the European ethics framework that look empirically at how those norms are applied, they clearly show three major weaknesses of the current system. First of all, the system is fragmented, in particular in the way in which it is applied. The system is very weak when it comes to the enforcement mechanism with absence of right of initiative by the advisory body themselves, uh, by the absence of limited investigative power with the sole exception of Olaf, which is competent only for serious misconduct by leaving a very wide gray area of conduct completely outside of the scope of his own investigative power. And finally, there is, as it stands clearly for the European Court of Auditors Audit, limited awareness among members, among staff about the existence of those norms and the way in which they're applied and their possibility to actually ask for advice before engaging into activities or into behavior that might actually raise issues in relation to compliance with those principles. So there's a bit of a lack of a culture stemming also from this uh, study and this observation of the status quo. So to sum up the URE, we have an adequate ethical framework we could potentially be proud of when compared with other experiences at the national level. But in practice, the system seems to fall short on its own mission to prevent and mitigate the most negative consequences by preventing and sometimes uh, uh, not adequately sanctioning major breaches and certainly uh, having reached limited awareness. As mentioned by Daniel and confirmed by uh, Ms. Jourova, in the mission letter, uh, there's a clear idea, which is an idea that has been floating uh, in the air for, for a few years now to actually establish a European ethics body common uh, to all institutions or to most of them in order to potentially overcome some of the flaws that I just described to you. This is not a new idea in the framework of my research. I realized, thanks to a request for acts document I introduced to the European Commission, that back in the year 2000, a, no, a proposal was made by former Commission President Prodi, uh, together with Nick, Neil Kinnock, to actually ask uh, the European Parliament and all the other seven institutions at the time to establish an advisory body that would have been competent for verifying the standards in public life. It's a very good uh, template uh, today, uh, certainly less ambitious of what we currently need, but something that has unfortunately didn't see the light of the day because this proposal was never followed through uh, by the parliament and the council and was taken up by several civil society organizations, in particular uh, Transparency International. In the meantime, very interesting, also the Council is suggesting the need to improve some harmonized frameworks when it comes to ethical frameworks. We see that the Council conclusion in response to the audit by the Court of Auditors clearly uh, push uh, towards the direction of a creation of potentially a European ethics body. So the question is, what sort of European ethics body can we envisage today? 
in the in the analysis that you will see in the report, I've been trying to identify together with my research team, which I thank very much, a variety of uh, instances and precedents, in particular, the French uh, Haute Autorité that has already been mentioned as an outlier in going certainly above uh, the standards today, but also the British example, the Canadian example, and the proposed new uh, public standards uh, commissioner from Ireland, which has not been adopted yet, but has been proposed in uh, significant uh, terms. Um, in short, uh, when you compare our European ethic bodies uh, existing across European institutions with these specific national experiences, you could clearly see that when it comes to the scope, the new normal among those bodies is to have a very wide scope, to have one centralized, one-stop shop authority that is competent to verify the respect not only by members but also by staff as you can see there are a lot of green lights on the first line when it comes to independence you can also see significant autonomy uh, by these bodies in relation to the executive or the parliamentary scrutiny when you look also at the monitoring role virtually all those institutions can actually take action in the case of france even civil society organizations do play a role in asking and in prompting the authorities to actually investigate and to uh, potentially uh, open uh, uh, an entire action vis-a-vis uh, -vis some members or staff. Same is true for the advisory role, same is true for investigative powers, and when it comes to sanctioning powers, also those authorities seem to be more consequential than the one that exists at the European level, uh, where uh, the sanctioning uh, power remains limited and very much in control of the leading sources of those actions. The budget, the staff also reflect the level of ambition and wide scope of those organizations. So out of this picture and comparative analysis, one could sketch an ideal European ethics body, an ethics body which also work as a one-stop shop, which has a wide scope, which has a wide and broad mandate covering not only the respect of ethical standards, but also lobbying rules, transparency register. That's a reality in a variety of countries I uh, share with you, and also an advice role. Uh, right of initiative, enhance investigative power, and possibility also to adopt orders. This seems to be what an ideal model should be able to do. But to what extent is possible to do so? Well, there are two possible ways, as already identified in the uh, guidelines provided by Ms. Europa. We can either rely on pre-existing European institution by conferring extra authority, or we can set up a novel entity. So very briefly, there are three major candidates uh, for a possible extra power, the European Ombudsman, OLAF, and the European Court of Auditors. When it comes to the Ombudsman, she already played, uh, because the Ombudsman is a woman, uh, a non-direct role in the sense that is already verifying to what extent the institutions are actually applying uh, the uh, ethical standards by themselves. You might all remember uh, the decision by the Ombudsman on the Barroso case, for instance. However, her authority by definition and statutory is not legally binding. Uh, it is very much uh, relying on moral suasion, and one might wonder whether this is the kind of authority it is needed for this task. And in any event, a revision of the statute, which by the way is ongoing, is currently um, uh, uh, needed. Uh, when it comes to OLAF, it also played a role already. Uh, as we said, it, the director can open internal administrative investigations for the more serious misconduct. However, it doesn't enjoy direct power, but it relies on the uh, member states authority. And finally, also here, a revision of the statute would be needed. And finally, when it comes to the court of auditors, uh, well, the court of auditors uh, main task is audit uh, the use of European funding and not necessarily ethical matters. And also here, uh, a revision of the statute would be needed. There are more broadly horizontal reasons that suggest that it might be uh, wiser to actually think about an autonomous entity as opposed to attaching extra authority because this organization might change their nature and might therefore uh, be uh, either watered down or excessively centralized in their authority. Therefore, I think that a novel entity would do a better job in actually pursuing uh, the mission we have identified together. Three possible legal bases seem to be 
potentially able to be conducive to the adoption or to the creation of a European ethics body. The first uh, legal basis is Article 298, uh, which has never been used, introduced by the Lisbon Treaty, in order to allow legislative power to the institution through ordinary legislative procedure to set up open, efficient, independent administration. 352 flexibility clause, as you know, is a bit of a jolly, very often used in European integration when uh, the competences are not explicitly granted uh, in the treaties, but the institutions still need to act uh, in relation to their uh, mission and mandate. And finally, Article 295, interinstitutional agreement, which allows the institution to come together and to bind themselves in order to uh, obtain uh, and to reach certain common objectives. So 298, uh, never used before, as I said, it is uh, questionable uh, whether it could be used for the setup of a European ethics body insofar, uh, insofar as uh, the members, uh, members of the European Parliament or members of the College of Commissioners are not staff. Uh, they are uh, rather uh, elected appointments. So they might not fall under the notion of European public administration. That's what most of the literature seems to suggest. When it comes to 352, unanimity is required in the Council, but also the nature of this provision is exceptional. Uh, so it's only residual, it's only when other, any other legal basis is not available that it could be relied upon. So Article 295, the possibility of having the institutions on a voluntary basis coming together in order to rely on their own procedural autonomy, so the competencies they already have, deciding to pull together and to share in the framework of a new body, the exercise of this authority would seem not to compromise any right, any obligation, and also to do justice to the Meroni doctrine, which basically uh, creates and introduce limitation to the possibility of delegating the exercise of power. This seems to be the most promising when compared among uh, the other legal bases. And in particular, the construct that one might envisage is the idea of having a basic arrangement among the institutions uh, that basically entrust uh, the respect of the ethics standards to this body. So it would be a combination of an interinstitutional agreement and an interinstitutional body. The body would ensure coherence, a coherent practice, throughout all the institutions. And this is a major advantage of interinstitutional agreement. There are precedents, uh, the European Personal Selection Office, EPSO, but also the European School of Administration, the Computer Emergency Response Team. These are interinstitutional bodies which were created in such a way. As you can see, no legal basis as such is available uh, to set up an ideal European ethics body. So even Article 295, even an interinstitutional agreement might not necessarily satisfy all our expectations when it comes to the ideal model we have identified, but it certainly go a long way to improve and complement the current ethics system. Apologies for the very dense uh, slide, but this is the key slide of my presentation and I'm very close to an end. With an uh, interinstitutional powered European ethics body, uh, we would be able to set up one single permanent oversight body, a task with the respect of ethics standards. The scope uh, would be wide, not only uh, relative to the members, but also to the staff, because the staff regulation already foresee a uh, enabling clause that allow the outsourcing of some, uh, the respect of some obligations, notably those in relation to conflict of interest uh, through um, uh, an interinstitutional agreement like this one. Article 2 and Article 9 both provide uh, such a basis. It is important to also identify a limitation here. Uh, not all the pre-existing staff disciplinary procedure would be substituted but it would still remain for non-ethical obligation, such as the residence requirement uh, or the harassment policy. These are issues that are not related to ethics and that would not be transferred to the body. When it comes to the composition, we can have an interesting conversation in the coming weeks and months, but the interinstitutional agreement might define a mixed model. And I think one of the most uh, a promising uh, answer or solutions come from the I authority in France, where you have a mix 
of political appointees uh, with uh, former members and with high judiciaries uh, representatives uh, all uh, mixed uh, together and only the president of the authority being appointed by the French Republic president uh, himself. When it comes to the enforcement, um, the important element is to imagine some autonomous monitoring capacity. And if you think about the potential of pulling together what is already happening, each institution already gathering all this information, financial declaration and others, and having them in a centralized register uh, that this body would be responsible of in a way in which the OI authority in France is already doing, and also leveraging on other sources, uh, a European harmonized whistleblowing protection system, and potentially also third party input uh, like civil society organizations being able to flag the issue to the authority. A right of initiative is essential, but this has to happen in synchrony with Olaf, who we see uh, is and remain competent and potentially after the current reform and the new interaction with EPO uh, will also continue uh, to be responsible for administrative investigation for the most serious misconduct. Investigatory powers could also be transferred. It's important to remember that the interinstitutional agreement can actually allow the institution to transfer competencies which exist, but which have not been fully exercised. And that's exactly where more investigatory powers could actually be uh, in, incipient within the body. And finally, when it comes to the sanctioning power, I think it's very important uh, this uh, idea of having uh, for the staff, the possibility of not having the appointing authority, uh, but to having with the enabling clause mechanism, the body itself being able to adopt those sanctions in the same way they do today, uh, in a way which is in full conformity of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and guaranteeing all possible uh, defense and due uh, process uh, guarantees. When it comes to members, there are limitations uh, in relation to the nature of the sanction that could be adopted. So in the report, I refer to soft penalties in order to capture the reputational uh, sanctions and the, those affecting the position, but they cannot go too far in adopting measures that the treaty uh, only entrusts to the court of justice when it comes to the commissioner or which the rules of procedure entrust to the parliament itself when it comes to members. I'm thinking about termination. Um, all these decisions of the bodies would be judicially reviewable uh, in front of the Court of Justice and also be subject to the administrative control of the European Ombudsman. I'm coming to an end in order to highlight the added value that I think a European ethics body might actually bring uh, to the European legal order and to the expectations, I guess, of citizens and potentially also of the political class and the staff itself to be in full compliance with uh, the uh, ethical uh, standards. The first added value would be to close the gap between the ethic standards as they are written in the books and their actual enforcement. Uh, this is uh, the weakness that we have identified in this report. And the way in which they would do so, uh, pulling together existing competencies among the institutions through the creation of a single permanent and independent body would favor uh, common approaches. And that's exactly what is happening now. Each ethic body is insulated uh, from exposure to the administrative practice or even judicial practice of other oversight bodies. This might lead to potentially a new administrative culture, but also a new political culture because inevitably uh, the overall conversation around ethical issues would be centralized while taking in full consideration the diversity of the normative standards that each institution has. So the body won't change the standard, it would simply make sure they are better applied in a more uniform, consistent, and in possibly legally predictable way than today. Thank you. Thanks, Alberto, for, for that very comprehensive um, presentation. I think that should be a good basis now to, to go into the uh, discussion. Um, maybe as a quick reaction from, from me, what I, what I take away of this for, for now, the drafting of, of the report uh, that, that we're going to discuss then in the, in the Constitutional Affairs Committee. 
I think um, when, it, when it comes to legal basis, indeed, I think your recommendation of an interinstitutional agreement is, is probably the, the sweet spot between, you know, allowing us enough of this ideal ethics body, uh, yet also allowing us to do something still this mandate, right? If we could do more, uh, I don't know, with treaty change, that might uh, be something that uh, that's a stretch uh, to to achieve in, in in the next couple of years. We've we've seen how difficult that is in in the recent past. I think also what you're saying in terms of the existing bodies and the advantages of um, in, in some form, a new body, or if you want a merging of, of, of those bodies that exist within the institutions right now, right? The advisory committee, the, the independent committee in the, in the commission, in a way, pooling that together and allowing us to, to standardize uh, or harmonize a bit the, uh, the view on, 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 on ethics, on transparency, on conflicts of interest. Um, and I think, well, one, one of the key uh, debates, um, Ms. Jourova has also mentioned it in, in, in her introduction, is of course um, the, the composition of, of such an ethics body, right? Who, who are the people at the end that will uphold the, the rules that, uh, that exist within the institutions? And there again, I, I think I agree with Ms. Jourova, we, we need to take care of the particularities of each institution. Um, uh, a, a lower staffer uh, certainly should face different uh, obligations for transparency and also integrity uh, than a commission president or a member of the European Parliament. Um, so, so you need somewhat different rules, but nevertheless, I think a common understanding of what is a conflict of interest, for example, uh, or how certain rules among the different institutions for a same level of staff should be applied is, is useful, but then overseeing this, my idea so far would, would be uh, that, for example, that you have uh, nine people in, in such an ethics body, uh, three each nominated uh, by the commission, by the parliament, and then by the EU staff that, that, that would be concerned, could, could be an idea to sort of take into account uh, the, the particularities and also the preferences of, of each institution. Actually, an idea that I got uh, from Mr. Pisapia uh, that, that talked about this uh, in, in the past. Um, and I think the, the last point I want to make here is, um, is what, what you said, Alberto, about the, um, about the decision powers, that, that ultimately one, one of the key issues here uh, is is sort of the self control of institutions that that we've seen in the past and that has uh, created some of these issues we we've seen in the past. So um, the the closer we can get to the ethics body, um, not not only giving advice and and recommendations, but actually uh, taking decisions subject to all the review that that you mentioned. Uh, by the courts, by the ombudsman, um, possibly even by, by the institutions themselves, but that, uh, that the first impulse comes from the ethics body, I think, uh, makes, makes imminent sense. With that, uh, let's, let's go into, into the debate. Um, first, I want to give the floor to, to Mr. Pisapia. Uh, thanks for, for joining today. I think there's two experiences that, that you've had had in the, in the past that are particularly exciting in a way for, for this. As mayor of, of Milan, uh, you had intricate experience with the uh, Milan ethics body, and, and that's indeed where your recommendation of this 333 three, three, uh, composition came from. And I think the, the second experience is that you're one of the five members of, of the current advisory committee in the, in the, in the European Parliament, uh, where, where I think you have seen a bit uh, over the last year and a half, maybe some of the shortcomings and, and would be very excited to hear uh, from you uh, what, what your thinking is about the EU ethics body and what lessons to, to be drawn from your previous experience. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. No problem. 
Thank you so much for your kind words, and thank you for having organized this event. It is the first event in which we discuss among different people, some people who've already met before about this, or some others who haven't. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Alemano, Professor Alemano. You're really very ambitious, but the objective is very important. Uh, the ethics uh, body uh, um, devised uh, by the European Parliament has some weaknesses. Uh, we all agree on that among the members uh, of uh, the uh, committee. And Daniel, uh, very often uh, you say that uh, there have been many infringements, uh, uh, conflicts of interest, uh, but so far the European Parliament has not uh, uh, um, taken uh, any uh, uh, sanction, given any sanction apart from a stance uh, taken by President Sassoli. I also worked uh, for G the jurisdictional uh, committee in the Chamber of Deputies. Uh, well, you mentioned uh, my experience, but there is a general experience. Uh, I mean, uh, all people, uh, we are all favorable, but sometimes there are some people who are not that favorable. So I think that we should really try and uh, make uh, the attempt to have uh, a further decision uh, by the uh, European Parliament, a resolution, a decision uh, or a position uh, by the European Parliament uh, that uh, leads uh, to a step forward uh, than uh, what we had in the year 2000, and that makes a progress vis-a-vis -vis what the Parliament uh, has uh, uh, done uh, and adopted uh, uh, during uh, this uh, last uh, period. Many resolutions, uh, but no step forward. Uh, well, thank you, um, Commissioner Jourova, uh, for your uh, speech. I would like to say very strongly that if we do not work together, the European Parliament uh, uh, in the uh, uh, lead uh, committee and then in the parliament and the European Commission, uh, we will not make progress and progress is necessary. We might not achieve the final uh, uh, objective, but we have uh, to uh, make uh, some uh, progress. Without uh, being united in our intentions, uh, without having uh, a clear debate uh, on the part of the European Parliament and the Commission, uh, we will not uh, have any progress. And Professor Alemano is uh, submitting uh, many proposals. We'll then have to decide uh, which is the possible decision uh, that might not only be accepted by both Parliament and Commission, but the solution that might have an impact also on the other institutional uh, uh, subjects at uh, a European level. It is maybe too early to say this, uh, but according to my experience, uh, we should uh, tackle this immediately. Otherwise, uh, we might write something that is very nice on the paper, but there will never be uh, uh, a tangible uh, result. For instance, uh, we could uh, at the uh, level uh, of uh, the advisory committee uh, um, in the parliament, uh, we could uh, make a step forward uh, and create conditions so that sanctions uh, are actually uh, uh, made effectively, I mean, because otherwise we lose our credibility with citizens. Uh, this study, the survey of uh, Professor Alemanna says something that I agree, and I suppose that most uh, institutions uh, also agree. We need to change. The status quo does not guarantee enough compliance uh, to the ethical uh, principles uh, that the European institutions uh, have uh, established. However, and uh, uh, Vice President Europa also expressed this, we have our shortcomings, but uh, compared uh, to some other national institutions, uh, we are at a higher level. That is, uh, we try to solve this problem, we discuss the problem, and we try to avoid uh, some behaviors that, that are not very frequent, uh, but that are important uh, for the impact they have in the public opinion. And we try to avoid them. And uh, uh, we want uh, 
to uh, um, preserve the credibility of the European institutions. For instance, the fact that Barroso, and I'm just mentioning this name because uh, others uh, uh, have also violated the rules, the ethical rules. Well, you know, many citizens uh, had uh, put their confidence uh, into him and the, I mean uh, they were really shocked uh, when they saw that uh, someone like uh, Barroso uh, uh, actually revolved the door and went to the other side I mean the person who was supposed to be the symbol and he was the symbol of a Europe that could actually face social economic uh, and uh, uh, um, rule of law uh, 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 problems well you know uh, they found that the European Union could not sanction, could not punish a behavior that was definitely not correct. And uh, this uh, fact that it was not correct is uh, uh, generally recognized. So uh, regardless of our, other, our political stances and positions, I think that we should really take actions in order to reinstate uh, the faith and the confidence of citizens. And then the resolution that will uh, prove and that in the AFCO committee will then uh, submit to the uh, plenary, I propose uh, that there are three levels. The first level is that of an institution or a body that is for all EU institutions. I mean, a regulation, a proposal. Well, you know, uh, the situation is so complex uh, that I think that uh, it's even more difficult than it was in the past. So let's uh, uh, consider three levels. Uh, if we could, this is the other level, if we could do two things. The first one is uh, uh, to change uh, the current uh, advisory committee of the European Parliament because uh, um, I think that that would have uh, the approval of all MEPs. That would uh, give uh, them the possibility of knowing the reality better and through the OLAF, uh, um, through OLAF, uh, we could uh, have uh, better investigations uh, and have certain sanctions. And on the other hand, and I'm not moving backwards, because I do believe in what uh, you've said. Well, but anyway, I think we should have a B strategy. That is, uh, uh, this decision, this joint decision, could start with uh, this meeting that we're having today, or in the past. Well, so the idea with that of um, creating a, a, an ethics body or an ethics committee that becomes real and that is uh, favorably uh, welcome uh, uh, by both the European uh, Parliament and uh, uh, the Commission. If this new ethics body or ethics committee can actually do some steps forward and uh, show that it can operate uh, and uh, punish uh, uh, when necessary, it will then uh, become autonomous and, uh, I mean, uh, uh, automatically the other uh, EU institutions will be part of it. Uh, some uh, uh, diffidence uh, is uh, probably uh, the uh, first reaction, but it could be overcome. So a uh, very last consideration, uh, you said that we've met uh, in uh, the past and we had very nice uh, discussions and uh, today's webinar is even more interesting, I think, because there are other people here. The fact that a, a, um, an advisory or a, a, a more operational body is composed uh, one third by, I mean, if there were an agreement between the various uh, um, actors, uh, we could have uh, three members uh, appointed uh, by the EP, uh, one-third uh, by uh, the Commission, and then one-third, that is the President included, uh, could be uh, uh, nominated by the Court of Justice uh, so that we would have guarantee of independence. That would be a great uh, signal 
of transparency that we would send, and we will certainly improve uh, uh, the credibility of uh, EU institutions, not only internally, but also externally. Well, according to the area barometer, only half of uh, the EU uh, citizens say that they are confident in uh, EU institutions. We have uh, to restart believing in uh, the EU, and we have uh, to remedy our mistakes uh, by showing uh, that something uh, tangible has been done in order to achieve uh, the final objective uh, that we do believe in. I uh, would, um, well, uh, mention uh, Voltaire, who said that the, the best uh, is an enemy to what is good. Uh, and I think that uh, going through what is good uh, will lead us uh, to the best possible solution. Thanks. Um, the next person I have on my list is uh, Stéphane Sejourné, who uh, thanks so much for jumping in uh, for, for your colleague at, at such short notice. Uh, thanks for being here. As I said, you're the, the jury rapporteur, uh, but you also know uh, from, well, being a French MEP, you're not only subject uh, to, to some of the, the rules here in the parliament, but also the high authority in, in, in France, where you have to submit a separate declaration where uh, they, they look into uh, what you have done and, and, and so on. Uh, so maybe you can, uh, well, not only give us your thoughts, but also maybe the experience from uh, uh, from living under the surveillance of, uh, of this new high authority. Thanks for being here. Merci beaucoup, uh, Daniel. Merci pour avoir organisé. Thank you, Daniel, uh, for having organized uh, this meeting. And uh, thank you um, uh, to uh, Alberto Aleman. Uh, uh, his report has been extremely detailed and very interesting. So I would like to thank him. And I uh, do agree with you because, you know, I'm uh, double checked, double controlled, sort of saying, uh, um, due to the control at uh, French level, with uh, which is extremely effective, uh, you know, that uh, the uh, high authority in uh, France uh, is really a success. In terms of transparency, I would like to recall that the organization was set up in uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, moments uh, with uh, um, political financial scandals and so the European point is extremely important because we need to go ahead to progress and to go beyond scandals and potential scandals. So I think that now uh, we uh, really uh, trust uh, that uh, it is important and then uh, we uh, know that uh, uh, the transparency is fundamental uh, in this context of political crisis. Uh, so transparency uh, leads to confidence, to trust. I think that uh, now everybody uh, is suspecting about politicians. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, when we have transparency, then transparency, transparency helps the politicians to really uh, make uh, their uh, thought and their work more confident. So this uh, uh, body, this European body, with regard to this European body, I'm quite favorable, I'm really favorable, and I think that uh, following the uh, French example, uh, that would be uh, important in order to enforce uh, the existing rules. Uh, there are several existing rules at European level. You have all these references, uh, uh, you know, with uh, several committees uh, which already exist today. So uh, there is also a definition of all of the scope, uh, um, and this exists, uh, and also uh, as in France, uh, there is uh, an enforcement uh, which uh, shall not be based any longer on uh, a, a relationship of political forces, but uh, I think that uh, uh, we need uh, to have uh, the same uh, consideration without uh, playing uh, on the uh, political relations and relationships uh, 
because, for instance, uh, I am really new in, uh, as a parliament member, and uh, uh, one of the first uh, political exercises uh, uh, we uh, did uh, was uh, the conflict of interest of European uh, commissioners, uh, and uh, I saw that uh, mm, that was uh, um, a subtle sort of saying uh, 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 in uh, uh, closed uh, hearings, uh, so there were no uh, mm, uh, there was not the transparency, you know. There were no journalists, uh, so uh, there were this conflict of interest. There were some people who say that uh, in Google they say so, etc., etc. So it was not uh, a work uh, which could be acceptable for the. Uh, European Union and for us uh, parliament members so uh, certainly there is uh, something that we need to do uh, I think that uh, it is, independence is very important. Uh, I think uh, that uh, we need uh, uh, um, some members who are uh, really irreproachable. But in any case, I think that each institution uh, has um, references uh, to uh, appoint them. So the quality of members must be imposed uh, uh, to each institution. And uh, uh, as uh, Alberto said, uh, uh, you know, it is important to really uh, leave uh, the entire arbitration to the Commission or to European Parliament, uh, to the Ombudsman, uh, to appoint uh, the uh, college members. Yes, uh, provided that they are qualified, they must be reproachable. Uh, they uh, have to submit themselves to a number of uh, rules. Uh, uh, so we need this uh, interinstitutional agreement. And then there is another important point uh, because uh, the uh, French high authority is uh, a, an accompanying uh, administration and not a sanctioning administration. And uh, so, Daniel, I think that we'll manage to convince our colleagues, uh, our European colleagues, in this way. And this is going to uh, protect us, you know, because including errors and mistakes uh, that are not manifest or voluntary, intentional errors, uh, but uh, in the errors, the mistakes that uh, a number of administration people could uh, do. And also the fact of not uh, being aware of the rules, not knowing the rules. Uh, this is important as well. So I think that uh, when uh, they uh, make their declaration of interest, uh, so it is important to correct a number of mistakes or errors. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, do I, I have shares? I hold shares. Do I need uh, to uh, sell these shares? Uh, which is the mechanism which uh, should uh, protect me uh, from a conflict of interest uh, in uh, uh, in relation to the companies I worked with in the past, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Uh, I think that uh, it's a uh, uh, sort of accompanying administration. And then also uh, the sanction sanctions are important. But in my opinion, uh, the accompanying element is extremely important. And then last point uh, with regard to the French example as well. The check, the control is uh, made uh, uh, before, uh, in the meantime, and after. So uh, I think that uh, the definition of conflict of interest uh, is uh, uh, requires uh, the importance uh, of uh, the situation after, because you know. Uh, for instance, uh, if uh, there is a, a politician who has uh, got certain uh, responsibilities and so can uh, uh, give uh, or provide uh, the private uh, uh, bodies or private companies with a certain know-how, so uh, this is uh, no more a barrier to the entry of a politician, but uh, you know there is uh, personal enrichment uh, and also uh, the fact that uh, um, afterwards, uh, you get a certain know-how, a number of uh, uh, set of information. Uh, when you are parliament uh, commissioner, you have a set of information available that you know about. And then uh, you know that information is extremely important uh, and uh, mm, uh, for companies in general and also for um, ad, ad, 
administration uh, uh, heads of uh, administration uh, in also in uh, ministries for instance uh, uh, they uh, these people are really um, sought for and uh, exactly for uh, this uh, exactly for information the fact of having a knowledge a lot of information and uh, so um, uh, thank you so much for having organized uh, this thank meeting. You. Thank you. Um, we're going to go uh, to our last speaker, Leila. Um, but already the invitation to, to everyone, uh, raise your hand if you want to intervene afterwards and, and ask a question or, or comment any anything um, here. You can, of course, if you don't want to intervene yourself, also write uh, the comments in the chat. Leila, your, your background is to fight against poverty. Bonjour. Um, social injustice, yes, um, and I think. I think. C'est okay, on m'entend bien. Oui. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, well, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Sorry, thank you, Daniel, for having organized uh, this uh, uh, webinar, and I would like to thank uh, Mr. Aliman for his report and his presentation. It is very interesting, and uh, uh, in our case, uh, because uh, um, we are studying this opportunity. I'm sorry, but there is an echo, which is quite uh, a problem. In Yeah, there is an echo. I'm sorry, there is an echo. Uh, with regard to the evaluation of conflict of interest and sliding doors within the European Union, uh, there are the, uh, those who uh, uh, work on this uh, uh, issue and uh, uh, also in the case of uh, parliament members um, have uh, knowledge, information, and uh, I believe uh, that uh, they uh, sometimes are considered in a different way. So there is a large consensus uh, with regard uh, to these uh, politicians. So it is no longer possible that uh, conflicts of interest or problems of ethics are examined within uh, the institutions in which they have uh, uh, these people have worked. So your analysis is extremely detailed. We understand the difficult role in which these ethics systems are um, concerned every institution in order to envisage sanctions as well. So the creation of a new ethics body which may outsource this work so to get out of the uh, uh, institutions concerned in order to have only one uh, body which is common to all European institutions. I think that we all agree on that. So we wanted that this body is independent and effective. With regard to independence, I believe that the issue of independence is strictly related to the issue of the composition of this body. We body is external, then the members must be re-dependent. Not be situation in which they have uh, they can be inquired or investigated about their cause. So I believe that uh, during the uh, in the commission um, we have worked about it, and uh, with regard to the composition of this body, uh, the independent ethics body. Uh, rather than considering one third, one third, one third, uh, um, we would uh, say, why wouldn't uh, we uh, find uh, people from uh, uh, OLAF or um, Court of Justice uh, uh, or uh, Ombudsman uh, uh, or also the civil society? Because uh, if we look for the uh, members only with the commission, Parliament. Uh, so once again, it is uh, difficult to be uh, you have to inquire and investigate about your own colleagues because that would be quite complicated, you know, uh, in terms of independence. Then, with regard to sanctions, uh, Mr. Alemano, 
in his uh, study uh, said uh, how to enforce uh, or apply sanctions. The only way to uh, have uh, all ethics rules respected uh, are sanctions, uh, uh, soft sanctions uh, or uh, stronger sanctions. So when there is a, a, the breach, uh, then it is important to have uh, also the sanctions. So the effect of sanctions uh, and uh, the fact that uh, the sanction has uh, a uh, power of uh, uh, dissuasion, uh, that is to say a, a preventive power. and. Uh, Uh, in my opinion, uh, this uh, should be considered. With regard, uh, as it has been mentioned, the several uh, different uh, legal options uh, for the creation, for setting up this uh, body, I think that, uh, well, relying on a, a body which already exists, uh, okay, but I think that the option, the best, better option would be to set up a new body. And it is obvious that, and this has been already mentioned by Daniel, Daniel, you said that the uh, modification, the amendment uh, of treaties, uh, you know, requires quite a long time and it is interinstitutional, yes, but uh, we should not have uh, the two things opposing one another. I think that uh, uh, if we uh, have an interinstitutional agreement uh, and if this allows us to set up uh, a, an independent body, ethics body, fine, but we should go beyond that uh, in order not to find ourselves in a situation in which only the institutions of the most virtuous institutions are a party in this agreement to this agreement and then the others don't so in order to conclude uh, i think that we uh, should uh, work um, in order to have an effective uh, ethics body. And uh, I think that um, all the people who are going to participate in uh, this uh, work, uh, it is important to consider the conflicts of interest, uh, considering ethics. This is not something optional. Uh, it is not uh, a, uh, an attempt uh, or something that uh, has to be uh, done uh, uh, from time to time, but it is something which is essential, fundamental, in order to uh, have citizens, European citizens, um, appreciate the European Union uh, based on transparency of uh, the people who have been elected uh, by the citizens. Thank you. appropriate button or you can write um, your questions into the chat. First person that I have uh, here with a question is Dr. Antonietta Elia. I, now you have to unmute your mic and then you should be able to ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. So, um, uh, first of all, thank you to convene that meeting, very interesting meeting. I would like uh, to express my gratitude to Professor Alemano uh, to, for his presentation and to uh, uh, and extend my gratitude to all speakers. Uh, just very quickly, I'm a professor of law uh, from University of Santiago de Compostela. Uh, and uh, so, I would like just to stress a few points uh, about composition of the committee, uh, which is really interesting to me. The form uh, of selection uh, of the members and uh, uh, the question in relation to independence of members is also relevant to me because if uh, one third uh, of members come, will come from each institution, I'm not sure that independence can be guaranteed, especially if one third of members 
still maintain their mandate in each institution. And uh, the other point uh, is uh, very important. Uh, and I think that Mr. Sejourné underlined uh, such a kind uh, of point is the question of the definition of conflict of interest. So to have an institution, possibly we just need also a share the definition of conflict of interest. What what we uh, what is the idea and uh, the definition, the content, the normative content also of conflict of interest uh, in a very broader sense. And uh, the other point that I would like to uh, receive about that the views of the speakers is the impact that the position of uh, inst European Union institutions can have at national level, especially to uh, those countries where uh, no agreement exists uh, about definition of conflict of interest. I think, for example, uh, let me uh, do reference to my beloved country, Italy, uh, and uh, uh, possibly uh, it can have a positive impact on the reasoning or, or the debate and possibly the creation of a national institution in such a countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're we're going to take two more questions, I'd say, and then, uh, then uh, do a round of replies. The next person I would like to ask a question is Ulrich Petzold. If you can unmute your microphone. You have to click uh, that on, on the unmute button and then you should be able to ask your question. That doesn't work. We go to the next person on the list, uh, Vitor Tishia. Does, does it work now? Yeah, now it works. Great. Oh, sorry, I just had a question to the professor uh, when he spoke about the uh, possibilities of Olaf to uh, have investigations uh, also for internal misconduct. When I look into that regulation establishing Olaf, I only see things against the financial interests of the European Union. So where does that mandate to look also into other misconduct come from? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and then now to Vito Tsitsipa uh, for for the third question of the first round. Vito. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear? Ah, perfect. Um, yes, hello, my name is Vitor Teixeira. I'm a policy coordinator at Transparency International EU. And I have a comment, not really a question. So, well, first I want to thank the, the you, Daniel, and the MEPs for organizing this event, uh, Professor Alemano for his excellent study and the commission for including the, the creation of this body in their political guidelines. Uh, I mean, TIU is, is happy to see that the creation of this body is being discussed. We have advocated for this body for a very long time. Uh, we have long identified the number of existing weaknesses in the current ethic systems at EU level. Now, uh, why I'm making this intervention is that we believe that the number one issue to address is the weak enforcement of the rules. And we believe that much of this is due to the current system of the peer sanctioning self-regulation. And to address this, this body uh, must, and this has been mentioned several times, uh, we believe it must be truly independent. And that means in terms of members, of staff, of budget, but also have the power to in initiate investigations on potential breaches and the ability to pass binding san sanctions when, when it is necessary. Um, we also think that it's uh, it's an uh, excellent opportunity to to address the existing fragmentation. This has also been uh, mentioned by Professor Alemano and several other speakers. Um, and we believe that so we're supportive of uh, measures to to 
to end this fragmentation. So replacing the existing Essex committees, we think it's essential, harmonize the rules and the definitions, uh, include both officials and new staff. Um, but it's also true that this body needs to work in a complementary fashion to other oversight bodies. It has been mentioned the Ombudsman and the OLAF. Uh, it would be a shame to see these uh, overlap. Um, but at the same time, it should also work very closely with other units that right now in the institutions work with ethical issues or in terms of lobbying the secretariat, the joint secretariat. Thanks, Vitor. Um, maybe we start the round of replies with with Alemano. The, the the most direct question was was directed to you, and then uh, uh, the others can can intervene if they if they want to. Alberto, thank you, Daniel. I found it very fruitful to receive so much feedback in in a matter of few minutes after working on this for over a year. I feel in good company. Uh, that's that's a nice feeling. Um, thank you to Daniel. Thank you to Mr. Pizapia, Stefan, Leila. It's nice to see uh, almost bipartisan support, at least many political forces seem to suggest that this is the time to break the impasse, what we define the impasse, the fact that status quo is no longer satisfactory to address the mounting public demand for different political behavior by members, but also by, by the staff. Um, interesting to see how much attention the issue of composition is drawing. Um, I think it's legitimate to spend more time on, on composition. And when I try to connect the dot, uh, thinking about the proposal by Mr. Pisapia, which, by the way, reminds very well the original proposal in the year 2000, in which each institution, each of the seven institutions, would have elect his own member, uh, seems to be interesting, reasonable, when it comes to seven institutions, when it comes to three I partly share uh, what uh, um, Professor uh, Antonietta Lia has been sharing, right? The, the importance of ensuring some more diversity. And that's why the study take the liberty to suggest a more, more mixity in the background of the members and refers also to the possibility of having de jure, former president of the Court of Justice, president of the Court of Auditors, in addition uh, to the possibility of having the three institutions uh, to actually designate their own members. So it is possible to blend them. What I found it very interesting in this model is the potential to mitigate and perhaps even neutralize the kind of partisanship that in the current application of the rules, in particular within the parliament, is impossible to overcome. So a composition is scheme to somehow overcome uh, one of the uh, nature or inherently limitation of the of the current system. Um, the second and last point uh, has to do with the normative contents of the standards. If this uh, body will emerge common to two or more institutions, perhaps initially the Parliament and the Council, as uh, Mr. Pisapia suggested, but then be open on a voluntary basis to other institutions joining along the way. Well, inevitably, the fact of interpreting those rules will create an administrative practice that at the moment is not visible because many of those decisions are not accessible to researchers, to the media. And therefore, this will be a major added value in, in hammering down the normative contents of this procedure. And I agree again with Professor Antonietta Elia when she said that at the end of the day, the EU has a unique opportunity to establish itself as a uh, model for many member states and therefore also to have best uh, potential practices. Finally, Wolfgang Petzold asked me about the legal basis for Olaf already being competent today. Well, this is Article 2, uh, letter B of the decision uh, setting, up, um, setting up Olaf, which refers um, to investigation, to investigate serious facts linked to the performance of activities which might constitute a breach of obligation by officials and servants of the community and as well members of the institution. So this is the legal basis for the director of OLAF already opening administrative investigation. And this is a competence which is there to stay because as you know, OLAF has been shrinked as a result of the creation of EPO. So potentially more resources uh, might exist in relation to the discharge of letter B of article two of the decision, um, I'm going to mention the number of the decision, 
to be complete uh, decision 1999-352. Thanks, Alberto. Uh, Giuliano, Leila, uh, do, do, do you want to react to, to any of the comments, the debate we've had in between? Go ahead, Giuliano. Well, this discussion is increasingly interesting because it's very concrete. I really like the idea of defining, of have uh, the uh, um, competent uh, uh, um, committee define the concept of uh, conflict of interest because uh, the case law is very uh, uh, vast and uh, we need to define both the guarantees that are to be granted and uh, also for the sake of uh, citizens so we need to have uh, something shared here and the second point is sanctions which is key without sanctions you're not credible sanctions uh, can be a deterrent because if a person knows uh, that uh, investigation might take place, sanctions, uh, punishment uh, might also ensure, and the uh, bad reputation uh, could uh, be another consequence, uh, you know, you have deterrence. And there is another element uh, that is very interesting. Uh, that is, in Italy, we had uh, a, a tangible experience. Uh, people who receive uh, some help uh, to be uh, rehabilitated and uh, reintegrated after uh, indictment, uh, you, uh, um, you have a relapse level that is 20%, whereas if you're imprisoned, uh, your relapse level is 80%. So if you're helped, you know, sanctions plus help is much more effective uh, than just uh, sanctions. The third point, well, we should always keep that in mind. We have our different opinions about the body composition, there, but EPs, uh, uh, European members of parliaments need to vote. So member of parliaments need to be represented. But at the same time, there will be resistance you know, no one would say, I do not agree, but, uh, you know, uh, some will say, I do not agree, but I don't want to be judged either. So we have to find a solution so as to guarantee for those uh, who are uh, might be under control that, uh, you know, the uh, guarantees are there. And then you need to have a level of independence uh, 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 that is the highest possible. And also having a nominees on the part of uh, the parliament or the commission does not lead to the risk of, uh, you know, indicating friendly people, uh, indicating people who are friends because you have different stances within the parliament. So a mediation is necessary. And I think that the same applies to the commission. Thank you so much for uh, what the experts have said. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Leila, you want to intervene? Otherwise, I would take a, a second round of questions. Um. Tu, tu peux prendre un deuxième tour de questions, Daniel. Yeah, you can uh, proceed to the second round of uh, questions. So go ahead. Okay. The, the first one I have on my list is Helen Dabusher. Helen, uh, yes. Thank you, Daniel. Can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for this very interesting debate. Helen Darbyshire from Access Info Europe. I'm also the chair of the Civil Society Coalition around the UN Convention Against Corruption and on the Steering Committee of the Open Government Partnership. And I have two comments. One is uh, on the role of this body. Um, just to underline, I think it was uh, Prince, some of the speakers mentioned this, um, uh, particularly Stéphane Sejourné, um, the, the combined mediation and sanction role, that seems to be something that's very important. 
uh, and based on experience of similar bodies, um, both on, on questions of sort of ethics and integrity, but also in other fields, um, such as transparency, which I work on, having that mixed role is important, but the sanction role is, the sanction component is absolutely essential. And it's something that clearly we're seeing with the kinds of problems as Professor Alberto Alemano highlighted in his excellent presentation. We've got the rules, but they're not being fully respected because there isn't, the consequences aren't there. Uh, so I think that the, the sanction dimension is really important. And the second point I wanted to make, again, drawing on much experience from elsewhere, is about the composition of this future body and its independence. And I, I, I do think that, th that there's two keys to ensuring a body is independent. One is who the actual members are, and the other is how they're selected, because it's the independence and it's the perception of independence. I would say just three representatives from each of the main EU institutions is not a sufficient solution to achieve both that in real independence and the perception of it. I would recommend, based again on good practice and experience from elsewhere, that there be some kind of open uh, selection process, maybe with hearings, uh, so that members of the public, civil society can follow that process, uh, understand who the potential future members of the body will be, um, and so that it has a certain distance from each of the institutions which it's overseeing. And to that, I'd like to address something that Vice President uh, Vera Yurova mentioned, a concern it sounded like she had, which is the need to maintain the independence of each of the institutions that this body might be overseeing. And, and I see a potential issue there, but I don't think it's necessarily a problem. The mere fact that institutions, public bodies have independence in doing their work, and that work should not be interfered with, having oversight that is itself independent, genuinely independent of compliance with ethics rules doesn't undermine in any way the independence of those bodies. And I think that that's something that we need to, an issue we need to address head on. An independent oversight body isn't per se an infringement of the independence. So I, I think that those are the, having a genuinely independent body with, with uh, decent powers is something that civil society around Europe would be very supportive of. And it sounds like uh, most of the speakers on this, uh, on this webinar are uh, supportive of it as well. So I hope that that's the way we can move forward. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Uh, I'm going to take two more uh, questions and then we do a, a, a final round of the of the panelists and, and, and wrap it up. Uh, the next person on my list is Mark Dempsey. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah. Daniel, thank you very much for organizing this. Um, my questions are going to be quite direct, and I suppose more for Alamano, um, who, by the way, did a great presentation, so thank, thanks again for that. Um, with the formation of such a body, given the lack of credibility, I have to say, our record um, the EU now has in encountering transgressions, whether it be rule of law or just playing out corrupt and, corruption and cronyism, and I say that as very much an EU person myself, um, and as a former EU policy advisor for the, for the Financial Conduct Authority in London. Um, I suppose, Almano, one, do you think such a body could genuinely work um, and, and therefore enhance the credibility um, of the EU? Um, and then my second one was really a more simple, direct one. It's really, if you have a former EU official, should they be banned from working in the private sector, in the sector which, which they represented the EU at, at all? Or should it be just for a short-term period, say, of two years? Um, anyway, thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and last question from Jean Comte. Uh, oui, allô, vous m'entendez bien? Oui. 
Oui, oui, bonjour, j'en compte, je reste à contexte. Euh, J'ai une question surtout pour M. Freund et M. Séjourné sur la question très précise des, euh, des commissaires européens euh, et des nominations des commissaires européens, et des, de l'évaluation de leurs éventuels conflits d'intérêts. Euh, J'ai l'impression que la plupart des rapporteurs en AFCO euh, penchent pour un organe qui euh, s'assurerait du respect des règles. Donc, j'ai vraiment un pouvoir à l'application des règles. Or, je crois comprendre que le jury qui est associé euh, penche plutôt pour un mot, enfin, penche au moins pour les commissaires européens désignés, pour un modèle dans lequel ils garderaient la main et la décision finale pour savoir si on déclare ou pas un conflit d'intérêts sur, sur les commissaires. Je voulais savoir comment vous voyez la question, si vous pensez que les modèles sont compatibles ou pas, et plus généralement, savoir si vous pensez que les commissaires européens sont un cas très à part de ce sujet-là. Merci. So, so one question was asked about revolving doors and, and whether people uh, should not enter the private sector. I, I mean, I, I think that most of the rules on revolving doors, particularly for, for EU commissioners and for former staff, I mean, you can discuss about the length exactly of the cooling off period, but in, in principle, uh, the rules there are, are good. Uh, it's not about a general ban of, of work, right? People should be able, once they leave a political position or even uh, quitting uh, their, their fonctionnaire uh, or their civil servant rule, should be able to, to work. That's a fairly fundamental right for everyone to, to exercise uh, work. What this is about is um, preventing conflicts of interest. So that needs an examination of individual cases. That's precisely why, why I'm so much in favor of this ethics body to, to judge on those individual cases and then to either impose restrictions uh, where, where appropriate or uh, to prevent certain uh, new employments when, when the risk of conflict of interest is too high. And I generally agree that a cooling off period uh, can make sense, particularly when people you know, uh, change to an entity that they have previously regulated or when, when there's too close contact uh, between the two or even something, I mean, the case that we had with Gerhard Schröder in Germany, that when in office, he approved the construction of a certain pipeline and then after leaving office, joined uh, that pipeline, basically created his own new, new follow-up job. And I think that's, that, that's really quite problematic. So cooling off period where, where appropriate, um, general ban on, on switch sides that the, so that the case of Gerhard Schröder, even after two or three years would, would not be this concrete case. Um, but no general prevention from working and obviously any restriction on work. So when people do face cooling off periods, I think it's normal that they uh, get some financial compensation for that. So I think a transitional allowance or some form of payment uh, and, and cooling off periods should, uh, should be coupled um, to, together. Um, Unfortunately, uh, for, for Jean Comte, uh, Stéphane Séjourné, I think, has, uh, has had to, to, to leave us, so I can obviously not speak for him. My own preference is clearly uh, that, um, that the body could, could decide on, on advice or sanctions uh, itself. Um, if, if that, uh, you know, uh, if, if the discussions that we're having among the shadows and among members in the parliament over the coming weeks and months show that uh, there, there is no majority for that in the House, uh, obviously we can discuss um, a better way of, you know, making a recommendation more binding than, than it currently is uh, in the existing structure of the advisory committee, for example, is, is a, uh, a plan B, so to speak, but that, uh, that I wouldn't favor at least in, in, in the first uh, round of discussion, let's say. Um, Alberto, if, if you wanted to, uh, to answer some of those questions as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mark asked a question about, uh, uh, about basically how those uh, instances of ethical violations or perceived violations uh, affect the EU. Um, I think it's important to realize that uh, it is not only the EU reputation that is, is damaged as a result 
of Mr. Barroso joining Goldman Sachs, but it is actually further amplified by the inability of the European Union or a willingness to go after him. This is a point that Mr. Pizapia made earlier on that I think is very important and should actually call us for action. So the EU has an urgent need to fix this internally and the ethics body is not set to gain public salience as such. Uh, as nicely reframed by Stéphane Sejourné, the idea is really to create a, a body uh, which is uh, advising in order to prevent behavior. And when those behaviors do occur, well, it will have to sanction. And I also agree with what Helen Derbyshire has been saying about the importance of combining the two. But seeing this committee or this body as an opportunity for the EU to fix uh, this incredible ethical deficit it has vis-a-vis -vis citizens, I think is, is important, is, is, is key. Thanks, Alberto. Uh, Giuliano? Well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the interpreters. Uh, the interpreters have been working uh, uh, for uh, almost two hours, their contribution has been in key. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Alemano said that we should have a preventive uh, assessment, uh, and this is key, this is very important, and this is uh, um, important also for the advisory committee of the European Parliament because uh, we receive various uh, uh, requests for an advice that we can give for certain behaviors, behaviors that have not act yet been uh, uh, um, carried out, but you know, uh, people who are in doubt consult us uh, to avoid uh, possible conflicts of interest. And I would definitely uh, give importance to this function uh, because this is the most uh, positive event of uh, the uh, advisory committee and the conduct of members uh, where you have independent members, as has been shown over this uh, one and a half years during which we've worked together. Thank you, Jano. Uh, Leila, any reactions? I know. I'm sorry, but there was a big noise. Uh, I'm sorry, but I had uh, to. Uh, uh, I, I need two devices because I have to listen to the translation from one device and uh, uh, to uh, follow the webinar on the other device. So, uh, uh, the uh, jury commission uh, would be uh, more uh, focused than uh, the AFCO commission, committee. Well, uh, I think that the jury committee, uh, with their experience about the appointment of commissioners, and uh, you know, I think that uh, it is uh, up to us, AFCO committee, to go beyond that and to go beyond uh, what uh, uh, regards commissioners. With regard to the composition, the composition of the ethics body, first of all, uh, I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the civil society, in my opinion, is important. And uh, yes, I believe that yes, the civil society should uh, follow the appointment of the members uh, uh, composing the uh, ethics body. I think that we should go uh, even beyond and that the civil society may participate directly in this body with the presence of the civil society in the composition of this body, this is a means to allow independence and to um, um, have the body separated from the institutions. And I would like to, to thank uh, you, Daniel, for the organization of this webinar and all colleagues who have uh, attended um, this webinar, Mr. Alemano and all the attendees and uh, their contributions were so interesting. Uh, so I must say that the civil society may rely on us uh, in order 
to reach the objective of an ethics body which is ambitious and effective. Thank you. Thanks indeed for, for the translation that uh, facilitates our, our European work. Thanks to all the team that uh, helped with all the technical setup of, of all of this. Uh, I'm very much looking forward now to, to the actual debate on the report starting uh, in the European Parliament in the, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, a conversation that uh, will continue over the next few months. So do do stay tuned. If you do want to follow um, well my work in the European Parliament on this, don't hesitate to sign up to my newsletter uh, that you find on my website. Uh, if if any questions remained unanswered today, uh, please do send them by email, um, and we'll make sure uh, to get them answered or to to transfer them to any of the other panelists. I'm I'm sure that's okay. Um, and yes, thanks, thanks for joining us here today and, and for this good debate uh, and looking for the next one once we have made the first steps uh, in, in, in putting something concrete in place. Thank you, everyone. Bye.